tatmewi oikala tatlahain laloita kina. Good morning, good afternoon for some of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this last day of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Conference hosted by the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. I am so pleased that you made this journey with us over the course of National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'm so thankful that you made this journey with so many Indigenous presenters and so much new knowledge. If you are one of my Indigenous relatives, um, you are now my auntie or uncle on my Zoom side because we're family now. <laughs> and I hope that we can continue this work into the future, um, striving for communities, indigenous communities free from violence. Um, if you are a non-native provider or somebody here to learn, um, please, uh, you know, continue to engage in this work as best as you can. Please continue to build these relationships with a level of openness and a level of vulnerability. This work is hard. We are carrying generations of pain, um, historical trauma, but within those stories are also stories of resilience and stories of very powerful ties to our culture and to our land and to our languages. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the Anthony ancestral homelands of the Burns Paiute tribe of Oregon, the confederated tribes of the Warm Springs in Oregon, uh, the Fort McDermott Paiute and Shoshone tribes, the Shoshone tribes of Nevada, the um, Shoshone Paiute tribes of Idaho and the Shoshone Bannock tribe of Idaho. We'd also like to recognize that Idaho is built on the indigenous homelands of the Coeur d'Alene Nation, the Nez Perce Nation, and the Kootenai Nation as well. Um, I encourage you all uh, to make a practice of acknowledging the homelands on which you occupy. Um, it is both a political statement, it is a social statement, it is a way of recognizing and honoring the ancestors who came before us. It is also a recognition of the atrocities that have taken place against our communities, but also a way to uplift and center the voices of resilience and survival that took place um, in the face of settler colonialism. Many of those effects were still feeling today. Um, so please continue to, to learn uh, the names of the land that you're on, continue to engage with those people. Um, our sponsors of this event are the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, um, the Idaho Council on Domestic Violence and Victim Assistance. Um, we have received support from the United States Department of Justice, uh, as well as the Indigenous Idaho Alliance who supported the bundles for our survivors today. Um, going back to this idea, this is our last time together. My big hope for us in our conversation today, however long it takes, if it takes an hour, if it takes the full two hours, what I want it to do is to be a culmination of all of the um, lessons and sessions that we've had over the past month. I want it to be um, a way of humanizing all of this practical and scholastic knowledge that we've learned over the course of this month. And really, it should be acknowledged that none of this work is possible without survivor and survivor families, without the efforts of grassroots organizers. Um, I do want to name um, much of my knowledge around MMIW comes from uh, Roxanne White, who is both Yakima and Nez Perce. Um, I want to recognize Jerry Muma from the um, Innovations Human Trafficking Organization, so her work in addressing this issue. I want to name um, Anita Lucchese from the Sovereign Bodies Institute and the work that she's doing um, with, in, in alignment with Lenny Hayes as well. Uh, there are folks who are really committed 
uh, their, their lives and their work to mitigating this violence in Indian country. And I uh, recognize that I'm just carrying um, my small portion in my lane, but I really wanna recognize that the community is doing this work. None of us operate alone. Um, I have uh, full faith from my tribe and from people in my tribe. I lean heavily on um, Bernie Lassart, who's joining us today, Audrey uh, Jim from the Shoshone Bannock Nation, and um, Carrie Picard, who runs the Uyit Kimti um, New Beginnings Program for the Nez Perce Tribe. So those are my, my aunties in this work who very often guide me and give me feedback on the way that this work should be done and how best I can serve the community and continue to serve the community in a good way. So I have deep gratitude and love for all of you. I do want to, before we begin, um, offer a uh, content warning for the material today. Um, when our survivors in community share stories, they are sharing their stories from a very deep, painful place. And we wanna recognize that that can be triggering for some folks. So please honor your human needs. Please take space as you need it. Please drink water and keep yourself hydrated. Uh, if we get very deep into this conversation, I will um, ground us again and pull us back to a place where we can take some deep breaths and then move forward in the conversation. So just know that we honor that if you have to step away, we honor it if you um, need to leave entirely. Uh, these conversations are difficult, but I encourage you to do your best to stay with us. Um, that being said, um, we may have some panelists show up a little later. We may have some leave and come and go. I also want to respect and honor that um, from uh, a place of community. Like we all like operate on Indian time a little bit. We um, we uh, like want to make sure that folks can come and go on this panel as they need to for their own wellness. And please excuse me, they're landscaping. It's happened twice this month. So it's really loud. It'll get loud behind me in a second. Um, I have been invited a handful of folks um, from as many Indigenous nations as I can um, in Idaho so that everybody's voice is reflected and centered in this conversation. I would like to start with Walena George. Um, Walena is from the Shoshone Bannock Nation and is a grassroots community organizer in that community around MMIW awareness. I am very excited to uh, have learned and seen some of the work that they're doing. I'm very happy that we were able to um, send money down to support the work that they're doing. Any work, um, any work that is done at the grassroots level is done out of pocket by these families. So we have to make sure that we are really doing our best with what resources we have to support their work. So Walina George is joining us. The conversation I have with Walina is around organizing and around um, community needs um, and around uh, you know some of the obstacles to, to bringing awareness to these issues. Um, Bernie has helped us um, facilitate survivors from the Coeur d'Alene Nation. Um, Debbie is joining us. And then Cinder Metz also is from the Shoshone Bannock Nation. If uh, some other panelists do join us, I will pause in those moments so that we can recognize them. Um, but I first would like to get started. Well, Lena, if you're still with us, if you can give us an introduction of who you are and the work that you've been doing um, over the last few years around MMIW, and then, and then we can go from there. So thank you for joining us. You're still muted, Walina. Hello, my name's Walina George. Um, I'm a Shoshone tribal member. Um, I do the Carrying the Message Recovery Group, and also we created the Fort Hall MMIP. Um, we're grassroots. We do everything on our own. Um, what started it off was my sister-in-law's son was missing. And she wasn't getting nowhere. So we started to do a group to bring awareness. And then when we were doing this, we brought a prayer walk to Fort Hall, um, which was led by Roxanne White from Seattle, Washington. Um, what I do right now is just be an advocate or just be there for the families that have missing people here in Fort Hall. Um, I also um, just 
do my best to get the information out there. We've been doing parades, walking in the parades with our red skirts and our signs of the missing. Um, right now we're working on a fundraiser to try and get bigger posters and may possibly a wrap for one of our transit buses um, for uh, Matt Bronco, who is currently missing. Um, he's been missing for uh, like 19 months. Um, you know, this work is hard. Uh, sometimes it gets emotional because, you know, I put my all into everything I do for MMIP. Um, it interested me when I would watch videos and stuff of people um, in the Indian country. And um, so I just, you know, put my all into what I do, um, try my best to get information out there, um, reach out to others. And, um, you know, I'm with Cinder, you know, I'm always by her side to help her advocate. And um, we see a lot of stuff or we see um, trouble with our police department, you know, not getting too involved. And so that's where we're at right now is trying to advocate and trying to get more involvement from our local police station. And that's about it. Thank you. That actually segues well into Cinder. Do you mind um, introducing yourself to us? Um, and then your, your current efforts around um, your son? Yes, my name is Cynthia Metz. I'm a Shosham Bannock tribal member. I'm also Matthew Bronco's mother. Uh, Matthew's been missing since March 20th. 2019, um, we've done uh, quite a few searches for Matt. Matt uh, supposedly disappeared in Snowville, Utah um, on the interstate there. Um, since then, we've been looking for him. There's been um, rumors that he may be, you know, in this area or there's just all kinds of rumors out there. We've been trying to get our law enforcement to assist, the local law enforcement, tribal police. We've also uh, requested assistance from the Box Elder County in Utah. Um, however, they've had some, some issues with jurisdiction and um, who should be handling the case. So that's kind of where we're at now with Matt's case. Um, there hasn't been any, any other news other than you know just rumors that are out there. Um, so it's been really hard for the family you know, trying to find out, get any information from anybody. So that's where we're at with in Matt's case right now. Just trying to get the um, different jurisdictions to work together on his case. Thank you, Cinder, for offering that. I, I have a couple of questions that I'll, I'll get to as we like move through the conversation today, um, but that's a, that's a great start and I appreciate you sharing that. And as always, I am deeply sorry that this is a struggle that you and your family are enduring. Um, and I and I have even greater gratitude that you're sharing this experience with all of us. And I hope that our, our takeaway today is um, uh, is some action steps that we can take to supporting you in in this work. Um, Debbie, I'd like to call you into the conversation. If you can please introduce yourself to uh, to the attendants, to the to the audience here, and um, let us know uh, your initial story around MMIP. Debbie, are you still with us? Oh, Debbie um, has no access to her microphone. That's okay. Okay. Um, 
All right. I know that we had, um, Bernie, can you tell me a little bit about Debbie's story? I know not for you to talk for her, but I know that you are familiar with it and you had Debbie at your uh, event last year. Can you offer a few remarks on that? Oh, you're muted still, Bernie. Okay. Um, I think the Debbie that is on the screen is my coworker and not oh. the right Debbie that needs to be on here. Okay. Um, is Marlene Sproul on? Um, I, I think, think they might be in the office together. If I sisters. don't see them. Oh, there's Marlene. I'll promote Marlene. Okay. Yeah. Mar I was wondering uh, Debbie about that. Be okay. in there with her. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all for your flexibility with um, technology. We send a lot of links out and a lot of emails. This takes a little bit of, um, of trickiness. Okay. So Marlene, thank you for joining us again. It's good to have you. Um, do you mind introducing yourself to the audience and letting us know your work around um, MMIP? Um, yes, I'm Marlene Sproul. I work with the Korean Tribal Social Services. Um, so uh, my sister Tina ended up missing in um, March of 1988. And so um, we, our family, have been searching for her and working with the FBI ever since. Um, that's how our how we were started in MMIP. Um, it's not one of the groups, of course, that you ever want to join, you know, you don't want to be a member of it, but, um, oh, it, it's been a long process. It's been a lot to process over the years, even. You have you have Debbie in the office with you? Yes, I do. Okay. Welcome in, Debbie. Hi, my name is uh, Deborah Garcia, and I work in the social services department under Bernie for a family resource advocate. And I was in college when my si my sister went missing in 1988, and I came here um, to the reservation and. Of course, we, we've we never given up looking for her. And there's more things that get in the system. Um, we've taken DNA, you know, at that time, they didn't have a whole lot that they could um, use, but now they have um, so much more data and stuff, you know, that they can use. So she is in the database system. Um, I think it was my, my father and I both took DNA and put that into that system. But no, it's been a tough road. And it's still just, at times, it's still just hard to, it's still just hard to deal with at times. And when you see other people that um, this has happened to, um, your heart seriously reaches out to them under the conditions that you know. And it's, it's heartbreaking to have any family fall under these, this category. Thank you, Debbie. Thank all of you. Um, I, I can't uh, begin to imagine the kind of um, pain that the family endures the loss. So uh, please know that we are sending you all the love that we can as, as part of your work to find your relatives um, and that we see you and that we hear you and honor what it is that your family is going through. Um, I, the questions I wanted to um, kind of move through. So a lot of us on this call are advocates, victim service providers. Um, direct service providers, healthcare providers. Some of us are in social work or in counseling. 
Um, so as, as advocates, and even as your community members and indigenous relatives, what, what would you like us to be, what would you like us to be focusing on? So um, Cinder, you're always very clear about how we can help you. So if, if you don't mind telling us like, what, what do you expect from us as far as support? What would be most helpful in this journey? I think with me, I'm always looking for resources somebody that could guide me with um, trying to get the law enforcement to work together. Um, I think in Matt's case, it's um, it more, it has to do with who has the authority to do, you know, do the work on the reservation and then there's also the fact that he disappeared in another state. So there, that's where the jurisdiction is kind of an issue in Matt's case, because we don't know if you know something happened to him here locally on the reservation or if it happened in another state. So um, for me, that's one of the things that I would like is for or need assistance with is the working better with uh, the law enforcement and then you know, providing that um, guidance or you know just to get me in the right direction absolutely we heard we heard from a law enforcement panel last week and it it was it went how you would expect they um they believe that they are in communication with each other sufficiently enough that these issues can be addressed um, only to have a sovereignty and jurisdiction panel yesterday tell us that that's not the case that there is deep seated animosity between agencies there's deep seated racism in some of these agencies so the what you need to navigate interagency collaboration is is insurmountable for all of us and I and I really um, I hear you when you say that, especially, and also so does my sister Melanie who does the research and data collection in this work, like trying to um, get a straight answer, trying to, to get somebody to communicate and respond is really important in this. So we will, we will certainly do what we can to support you in that. And I'm loud and I knock on doors. I actually kind of barrel through them if I'm being completely honest. So we'll certainly um, remember that that's what your needs are and we can work from there. Um, so my sister family from Canada has joined us. So I'm really excited to have Tabitha um, and, uh, and your colleague. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name yet, but Tabitha has a performing arts group that brings awareness to MMIW and also has a story uh, as a survivor family. So if you don't mind unmuting yourselves and then introducing us and letting us know, or introducing yourselves to us and letting us know what your work is in community, Tabitha. Can you hear us? Did they freeze? Oh, Tabitha, can you unmute and tell us who you are? Hi, uh, my name is Tabitha Frank, and I come from the Qualified Housing in Massachusetts. And I'm here with Jacqueline Hanu. She's my coworker. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jacqueline. Um, I am Wewekai and Namgis on my mother's side, and I'm Nawa, which is Indigenous Girls Adver on my father's side. Um, I'm also part of Butterflies in Spirit with Julia, uh, and uh, we work alongside each other. I'm the Women's uh, Support Coordinator here. Thank you. And do you, I know, oh, Tabitha, you. you um... Go ahead. No, I, you were going to continue and probably answer my question. So please keep going. <laughs> so what we do um, with Butterflies and Spirit, it was created by Lorelai Williams eight years ago. And it's a group of um, family members of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And what we do is we perform um, cultural and a little hip hop together, just to raise awareness for the missing murdered Indigenous women and girls. 
Um, we block off streets, we stop traffic, we do whatever it takes just to raise awareness for the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And we also represent our own family members. So I do have um, three family members in my family that have been missing or murdered. I have um, my aunt, Iris Frank, she was murdered in 1980 and her case was never solved. And they kind of brushed it under the rug saying that she fell in the water and that's how she died. And my son has an aunt, her name is Lisa Marie Young. She went missing um, June 30th, 2002. And till this day, she's still missing. And there's a suspect, but they choose not to name him anymore because it's now to him and his family, it's, it's harassment. So what, what, we're not allowed to say his name anymore, which is, I find, excuse my language, but it's bullshit. <laughs> and I have a niece that was um, murdered by a police officer Sorry. Um, June 4th, 2020, um, she was shot and killed um, during a wellness check. So everything we do with our performances is also giving healing to other people that have gone through these situations. And we stand for missing women and girls. And it's it's emotionally draining, but we do it because we, we want to continue to raise awareness for this issue. And um, how I got into it was actually my job at the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center. Um, I just wanna make it clear that we don't work for the police. Uh, we work for our communities. So what we do here, we um, go searching for these women so a family member comes to our office and says, hey, I have my sister, she went missing like 24 hours ago and the cops aren't doing anything. We need some help, we need to find these women. So what we do is we print off missing uh, people's posters and we go up and down the streets and we hand out these posters, we go to bars, we go to the last place she was seen. And um, we just basically search for this person until we find them. And we've been doing this, Jack, Jacqueline and I have been doing this for the past year and a half, almost two years, almost two years. And so far we've been successful six for six. And it, I enjoy working here because of that. Like we get to not only raise awareness, but we actually do the physical work. We go out there and we search and we find these girls. Yeah. And is there anything you want to say to that? <laughs> uh, I think he's that. Yeah. yeah, like so far, I guess part of my job is actually working with the family members of MMIWP um, or MMIWP, um, and you know we're we're on the both of us are on the the MMIWP coalition here in Canada, um, and yeah, I think the most important work that we're doing um, here at this office is. Uh, is doing the searches, the physical searches on the downtown east side. Um, yeah, the women have been, some of them that we found have been in some very dangerous situations, but we were able to remove them, you know, send them back home um, where they're safe, connecting them back with community so that they're not just left on their own. Um, the reason why you end up on the downtown east side is for various reasons, but um, connecting you back to culture and with your family and having those connections are super important. And we make sure that that happens before we, you know, send them to their family members or their loved ones. Thank you. And again, I, I am very sorry for the loss and for the for the struggle of having to navigate these systems with, without, I mean, we have systems that are meant to protect our communities and it sounds like you have to work outside of that system to actually have some success. So I'm, I'm grateful that there have been six 
young people who have been returned home. So that I have a lot of gratitude that you're doing that work. Um, I also now immediately think like, are, are you also safe? Are you taken care of? Because it is emotionally draining work. So please take care of yourselves in that. Um, Debbie and Marlene, if you can, if you can jump in here and um, the amount of time that's passed. So can you tell us what your experiences is like with law enforcement, with victim service providers, when, when you have to, when so much time has passed, um, do they get, start to give you excuses? Like what has been your experience as you can continue to search, as you try to find healing? What is that, what is that like for you? Well, I think that for me, um, the one thing that I think is difficult is you don't have a body. And that was one of the things that um, the FBI and law enforcement was that, you know, when you don't have a physical body that has any um, evidence or anything, or you don't have the um, anywhere to go, they can't prosecute. And so that's what makes this whole thing difficult is not being able to prosecute or to even look at anybody that may have had anything to do with it because they really want the physical body. And I, I don't remember what case it was, but within the last year, there has been um, prosecution um, without a physical body on another case. And I, I was going to look that up and I didn't have an opportunity to, but I know that there has been prosecution, um, not in Indian country, but on another pretty publicized case where um, they were able to prosecute, I think it was a husband that um, did his wife in and they didn't have the body, but they had all circumstantial evidence and whatever. And so it's really, really difficult when um, I think the other thing that is difficult is the turnover. And so um, you do get uh, police officers that turn over. And so um, it's, you end up having to tell the story all over again. And um, that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, uh, the other thing is, is the, even the FBI, um, they've been really, really, I have to say that the FBI in our area have been really good because uh, we had an initial investigator and we met with him many times and he was working on the case. And then when uh, he left the area, he introduced us to the new FBI person and that person came in and actually just retired. And we met the new one, the third one, um, and I don't know if this person, we were told he may not stay on the case for very long because they may transfer him. And so that's been, um, it, it, it's been a difficult case because of many factors, but the most one is we don't have a body. And you were asking earlier, um, what kind of, what kind of uh, resources do we need as uh, families of um, MMIW. And so one of the things I feel that, especially in our case, where the person's been missing since 1988, 32 years ago, um, is closure. At some point you need to have closure. And uh, my sister Debbie and I have been talking about, we're going to do a stone this next year. We're gonna get a stone and place it up in the graveyard. Our family needs to have closure. And, you know, you don't ever think about your family never, um, about a person not having a marker or having something up in the graveyard. But when you have an MMIW, a, a lot of times there is no body because they are missing. And so you don't get closure. You don't get all the things that our traditional burials um, call for. You know, you don't um, get to have the funeral. You don't have the mourning days. You don't have 
a lot of the things that are our people you don't have the giveaway you don't have any of these things that help a family process and work towards closure and so um i know we've talked about uh, moving forward and trying to get some closure for our family not, not that we would ever give up and i don't think any family ever gives up looking because you always hope for that but you've got to move forward and have some kind of closure. And it's not just that. As we get older, we realize there's nothing in this world. When after we're gone, nothing in this world that says she even existed. Except for that stone. Except for that, stone. Except for that marker. That our people go and they, and they take care of the graveyard. And every year, you know, they go up there. And, and, and it's a time to go up there and to have communication with that person on a mental level, an, an emotional level. And so that to me, I think is important is looking for that type of closure, looking for um, how are you going to do it? Who's going to do it in the family? What kind of community support are you gonna get when you're going through that process? Thank you for that, thank you for okay, so. So for me, um, I guess because, you know, back in 1988, that is 32 years ago, and there wasn't enough, um, there wasn't enough evidence, and there's not, there wasn't enough, like, um, oh, it's just, it's hard to say, there wasn't enough, like, they couldn't prove, you know, anything uh, for anybody, so it, it basically it leaves us with nothing and so then the data that they can collect today is so much more than what they could at that time so i feel that we even lost more you know of it on that end because of that they couldn't collect enough data um and yeah me and marlene have talked about you know if um about closure because um her tribe um, I don't know, it was some years back, they, they declared her dead. And I don't know, that kind of hurt a lot because how can you do that without, without her? You know, they, they, they closed it, but it's still open within the FBI. But um, I don't know, that's kind of devastating to me. She's, um, it's, yeah, it's been 32 years. So I feel that it's time for us to put a marker in the graveyard for her because that is solely the only thing that will say that she existed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, that, that brings to mind um, some, some complications uh, in working with the police, uh, Cinder, you've you've talked uh, a bit about your experience from one uh, moving from one agency to another. Can you? I mean, that's that's my experience with you. So, if you're willing, would you share with the audience today, like that process, how you started and and where you are now? Because I recall from our conversation <clears throat> a month or so ago, you've engaged with nearly six agencies, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, when Matt went missing, he supposedly went missing in Snowville, Utah. So I was working at that time with Box Elder County in Utah. Um, I wasn't, they were unable to find, we were unable to find him in that area. Um, there was no physical body. The only thing that we found was his truck and his belongings. So at that time we were working with Box Elder County. Um, there was his last place, known place at home. So we were working with the Fort Hall Police Department here, our tribal police. And we were also working with 
Bannock County and Bonneville County Police, because supposedly those were places that he was last seen, or we, we knew that he was in those places. Um, so that was kind of, and there was no body or n nothing to show that he was anything physical to prosecute. There was no evidence. So, so at that time, so it just got left alone after because there was nothing to show other than, you know, he was here and he was there. So, um, my issues were with the our tr local tribal police. So in his case, um, it started with, you know, they were doing, they were questioning individuals to see, you know, what they knew. And um, when those people didn't want to talk to them, well, then it was Box, or Box Elder County that originally had come in and requested to um, interview individuals. And then when those individuals didn't want to be interviewed, well, then they said, well, we don't need to talk to them because they're out of their jurisdiction. So, so um, our tribal police tried to assist, but in my, the way I see it was our tribal police weren't qualified. They didn't know how to Re interview these people so it kind of it got left alone so and in that time frame we've had uh, different people working on the case or people that have left um, for about a good eight months the case was left alone so um, so that's kind of where we're at on his case now so We've been trying, Willina and I have both been trying to get um, our tribal police in Box Elder County involved. There have been uh, new um, investigators assigned. So right now it's frustrating because now we're having to uh, refresh them on you know what transpired during that, that time. So that's kind of where we're at with his case right now. Yeah, I think that you bring up something that's really um, pertinent is the fact that, um, you know, like for us, that the tribal police, um, they weren't trained, they're not qualified, especially back in 1988, you know, um, and there was another problem too that I seen back then was that um, the FBI agent wasn't really that well known. Nobody really knew that FBI agent very well. And so in Indian country, if people don't know you, they don't trust you and they're not gonna tell you anything. And so, um, and I knew that. And so I know for my sister, I went out and did some investigation myself and actually got more information and was able to relay that on to the FBI um, just because people wouldn't talk with them. And so then we had a new one that came out shortly thereafter, like I was saying, and it takes years to build that rapport with our people to have that relationship to where people are going to say anything. And so it literally, it took years for that other person to come in and get that rapport and of which he did. And like I said, he retired and then now we have another person coming in. But it, it to me, that was, um, it made it more difficult, I think, to do anything about the case, to proceed with the case in the way that it could have been proceeded with it, if it had been um, somebody that had a really strong relationship with our people, that our people were willing to talk with them and tell them what was going on and people with the skills even in our own tribal police department back then, which was, um, it had went from a BIA police department to um, our own tribal police that is run through our own um, government and stuff now, but it has transitioned a lot. And so we didn't have the skilled professionals um, back then or the 
um, and I don't know how it is out in Indian country right now. I mean, I think every reservation is different and whether or not the, um, the FBI is considered to be like someone that's in the community that people feel friendly enough to talk with them and let them know what's going on or if there's still that stigmatism of the FBI is here, no one say anything, you know, it, everyone's really close lipped. Yeah. <clears throat> we, um, one of the things that's really interesting that I'm learning, thank you for sharing that, both Cinder and Marlene. Uh, I work in the community as a community organizer. So it's also like helping my relatives in social movement spaces navigate this really dysfunctional relationships our communities have with police officers, right? The police brutality almost creates a division between folks who we are entrusting to protect our communities with the violence that they're perpetrating against our own people. So it's really a, a difficult relationship because I, I'm holding a couple of truths here that one, the police are the ones who are supposed to be investigating and bringing us to some conclusion in this work, um, while at the same time, there's just so much violence from the police in our communities, uh, so much racism often perpetuated that that makes having these relationships um, grow into something that's meaningful or grow into something that's healthy. So um, that actually brings a, a, a question to mind um, for Tabitha, are you still with us? Yeah, okay. You all have been successful six times with your own community policing organization. So that's essentially a model of um, transformative justice. Like you've taken it upon yourselves in the community to do this work. So what have been the things that made you successful to find six of your missing relatives? So just to add on to what you were saying with um, holding the police accountable for their actions, that's actually what our organization does. Um, us as the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center, we try work with um, our community opposed to working with the police. So for example, let's say um, a police officer did something to a community member and the community member doesn't wanna go to the police. So they come to us and we actually hold the person accountable for their actions. And we basically go up the, the chain of, <laughs> of, command, yeah. of command. And um, going back to uh, us being successful, finding these women is reaching out. We reach out to social media. We've been successful that way. We've gotten leads from Instagram, Facebook, people that have seen her last. We also have connections on the downtown east side. Um, most, most people didn't trust us in the beginning. Um, as soon as we lifted the flyer, they kind of just brushed it off. Like, nope, we've never seen them. But now that they understand that we're actually there to help our community members, we're there to help find these women, they help us now. So they write down like, oh yeah, we've seen them at this bar at this day at this time. So we would go there and then we would ask to look at their surveillance cameras. Not us personally, but we have a NPO, um, our neighborhood police officer, he actually goes to these places. So we also have someone backing us up at the same time. Like we have, um, we work on both sides, like we're the person in the middle. <laughs> so the purpose of our office is to mend the gap between Aboriginal people or Indigenous people and the police, which as you can imagine, especially during a time like this is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're going out in our community, like people know that we do work for VACPC, um, but they also know that we're there to, to help our sister. We're, we're taking our sister home, bringing her home. Um, and I think one of, one of the reasons why we're so successful um, is that we will actually post the last known person she has been, she is with, and it could be a male. Mm -hmm. So it makes the male very uncomfortable wanting to give us information on where he last saw her and, you know, 
taking that responsibility off of him so that he's like she was last seen here and you know um taking the community's leads seriously uh you know when they when they're calling us and they're saying this person's here right now uh we get in our car and we go there immediately we don't take our time you know and it's day or night we don't like our office is open nine to five, but we work all hours of the day or night. So if a missing sister goes missing at 7 p.m., we're not gonna be like, oh, you have to wait till nine. We'll, we'll get at it tomorrow. We're, we up and leave. Like we get up, we put our shoes on, we grab our you know, gear that we put on to go searching and take those posters and we go looking for them. So we, we look until around 11 or 12. And then we, if we don't find them that day, we start again at 9 a.m. Yeah. I think a lot of us could take, um, uh, maybe dig, dig a little deeper down the road um, with what you're doing to build relationships with police officers like that accountability thing is is actually a huge rift here um we even some of the law enforcement officers last week on the panel named that like what is it like to be a police officer that is nez Perce in the nez Perce community trying to build relationships with neighboring county sheriffs um with the fbi i mean all of those things get really complicated um i really quick somebody in the audience has asked can you repeat what vacpc stands for Vancouver oh. Aboriginal Community Policing Center. Vancouver Ab Aboriginal Community Policing Center. Okay, thank you. And but you're not the cops. <laughs> I love we're it. We're not. Love that. We're, not <laughs> we're, we're not officers. <laughs> we're we're partially yeah. funded by VPD, but it's mostly a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. We just because we are funded by VPD, we have to have the word policing in there, which is unfortunate because it's misleading. So when we go to, you know, powwows and stuff, people see our table and see our vendor and they're like, oh, policing, we don't want to deal with you. And they're like, no, actually we're here to help our community. We're not here to, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of misleading. So we're trying, we're really trying this year to change the name. <laughs> we are working on it to change the name, to take that out, but it's yeah. a work in progress. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Totally understandable. Uh, Minneapolis has something similar. Last year, I went out there for a conference and met um, met a young woman who's from the Anishinaabe Nation, and she does something similar um, where she she's the liaison between, I think it's called Little Earth, which is their like urban Indian community in Minneapolis, Little Earth or White Earth. I can't remember. I'm sorry to my Anishinaabe family in Minnesota. Um, they and so she acts as like the person who's like here's the cultural knowledge that you need to work with us here's where we think you can find people here's the obstacles and why you can't get certain responses from the community so i think that that might be um be a model worth duplicating in other places uh, mm -hmm. if we first like have to address this racism thing like that's a big deal i'm gonna keep yes. like underscoring that because that is a very very real issue, uh, especially in Idaho. I mentioned yesterday during the sovereignty and jurisdiction panel yesterday on 1A national public radio, um, Idaho has been identified as this like hot spot for white supremacy and domestic terrorism organizations, which is, which is even more um, terrifying in this work, right? When so many of our indigenous women face like 70% uh, interracial violence and then that interracial partner is usually a white man and that I mean it, it's very disconcerting for me it's disconcerting for my sisters in my community so it's something that we really have to hold as a truth that this is taking place um, so that that brings to mind uh, a couple of other questions thank you um, Jacqueline and Tabitha for that and Tabitha I'm sorry I don't know how to pronounce your indigenous name otherwise I would try to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult um, it I actually I tried to shorten it. Huya is like the shorter version, but the longer version of it is Huyatnik. So it's it's a okay. bit like of a tongue twister, but Huyat is just the shorter version. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I want to honor that for sure. That because people identify you that way, and I, I just don't wanna I don't wanna ruin your name. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Um so I mean, that, it's really great to hear um, different perspectives and relationships with law enforcement and how 
those relationships influence your experiences as survivors and survivor families. Um, uh, Walina, I want to come back to you if you're still with us. You, because you do some of this grassroots organizing, that means that you have a very unique position um, in working directly with the community. So what are the community needs that folks are asking for? Because they'll tell you before they tell me showing up with a clipboard, before they'll tell a police officer. So if you're still with us, Walina, can you tell us um, what the community has been asking for as far as support goes? Um, what we've been just noticing is the awareness um, with my sister-in-law and her son. It was the local tribal police that we're, we have trouble with, um, like getting the FBI involved. Um, but more of it is like getting the posters out there, um, letting them know that we're out there doing awareness and um, the community just accepts what we do when we're out there, but we just try to be out in the public. Um, I reached out to a girl in Pocatello. She does the trafficking. So she does a lot of awareness for us too. And, um, but we just try our best to keep pushing our posters, pushing our awareness out there. Thank you. And that's, I think that's something that we'll continue to try to support you with. Um, because awareness is the first, gr grassroots awareness especially, is our first connection to community. So thank you for sharing that. Um, have you, again, one more time, Walina, I know that you had a prayer walk last year. Were you able to have one now in the face of COVID, which I'm sure makes this organizing a million times more difficult? Um, no, we weren't this year, but we, um, we want to organize like a car parade um from one of from blackfoot to pocatello with our signs and just have a you know caravan showing that we're still doing awareness out there and um part of that community question was um i didn't really answer it we're a um, recovery group too also we do um recovery and most of our community comes to us through when they're struggling with alcohol and drugs they'll bring some to us, you know, and then they'll be asking questions. And so we try to help answer as many as we can, but um, it's just, you know, we're, we're struggling on finding how do we get our tribal police involved. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, part of this, uh, this conference has actually helped us map a couple of connections that I think would be really useful. So the NAMIS training and the Amber Alert in Indian Country is a resource made available for free to tribal law enforcement. So making sure I'm connecting one agency with another and then somehow finding a an accountability mechanism like what does that look like to make sure that the law the law enforcement agency is actually learning those tools or even taking advantage of these trainings that we have and taking advantage of these conferences um, so that you know we know that the law enforcement officers are equipped with the right tools to support us in our MMIP work. I'm gonna take a pause here because I think my ASL translators are gonna switch, but I also want to ensure that our closed captioner has been caught back up. We kind of went a little too fast for them. So I just wanna take a moment to make sure that we're okay. <clears throat> Lisa, if you can chat me really quick and let me know that you're okay. And for those of you who are using closed captioning, I'm sorry if um, I went too fast. I don't wanna leave anybody behind by any stretch. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, ASL translators. Uh, for those of you who are planning any sort of virtual conference in the future, I encourage you to make including ASL and closed captioning a practice um, rather than an accommodation. Uh, the Idaho Coalition stands on radical inclusivity, so that means that we, we ensure that everybody has access from the beginning without them having to make that particular request or having to carry the cost of it. So I feel like that's been a win for our conference, our virtual conference this, this year, this first time around. Um, 
shifting gears a little bit. Um, and I, I don't want this question. I actually, in fact, don't want any of my questions to be intrusive. So again, I will just reassert that I am deeply um, thankful that you are offering these stories and offering this insight to those of us who um, have not experienced this in a direct way. So again, deep gratitude. Uh, my next question is regarding um, what healing could look like or could feel like for you and how could the community help you in that healing process? And, and for those of you, Cinder, I know that you're still in a live investigation, but we wanna support you as best as we can in the healing space. Um, Mar Marlene and Debbie, 32 years is a long time. Um, so outside of the headstone for you as indigenous women, what, what has your healing journey been um, while at the same time trying to uh, navigate MMIP in your family? Well, for me, um, I was attending college when, I, um, when that happened to my sister. And so um, I, it was spring break when that happened. And so I was um, having a lot of emotional breakdowns, just crying. And I was trying to figure out what I, how I was gonna navigate the rest of my life and what I could get through and what I could do and I think part of the process for me was realizing that um, my sister would have wanted me to go on to college and she was at a point where she was going to go to school with me. And so um, and we had been planning that. And so um, I decided to just stick it out. And thank goodness I had a lot of friends and a lot of support because it was my friends and my uh, professors at school. It was um, the community that anytime I just, I needed to have a moment where I needed to cry, that they were there and they were supportive and they let me have that moment. I would get through it. Sometimes I would have to step out of the class and just have a moment and then go back in. Um, but I was able to get through it and I was able to uh, pass my grades and I have a double major and a minor. Um, so it's just working through it and trying to get and the emotional support I think is really important from the people that are around you and the people that you surround yourself with. And it's just maintaining that support and not just from the people but from your family especially. Um, so. Uh, when I had filed for a missing persons for my sister, I went and got my sister Debbie um, right away because she was over at college at Eastern Washington and I did not want her to find out on the news. I did not want the media to take a hold of this and spread it out to my family and then have them sitting there without any support. So um, we all gathered close and we all um, pretty much hung around the, in the same house for at least the first week and um, just maintained that real closeness and tried to support one another and get through it. Um, even though they didn't have a body, we felt it. We knew she was gone. We knew the day we could really, we could feel it that day, we knew. And um, it's just something when you have something like that happen, the connection that you have with somebody on such a spiritual level that you can feel when their soul is no longer walking this earth. And so, um, yeah, it's the family support that you get and how you are able to pull together and then the community around you. It really, it, I know for me, it really helped out a lot. So for me, it's it's kind of a lot, you know, with the, the healing of the community and family support, but um, I've always felt that my sister's spirit has followed me. Like, um, I, I know when I feel her presence, there's, um, like, so I used to have this job within the tribe and I was a janitor for years. 
And every time I would walk into the pop shop, I had one of the officers tell me that, and he was the chief of police at that time. He says, Debbie, I don't know what it is, but I have this lamp in my office. And every time you come in the building, that lamp goes on. And so I said, it goes on. And he said, yeah. And I said, I said, I believe it's just my sister. She follows me everywhere. And so like, even in my house, I have, um, so that's kind of a healing thing to me because even though she's not here, she's still here with me and I can feel that. So, and it works through, um, it works through like electronics or something like TVs and, and radios because there is no explanation for those going on. But when I turn the TV off and I walk away and it's on, and I look back and then, you know, down the hallway, the TV goes on. So I go over and I turn it off again. And then it comes back on and I said, okay, yeah, go ahead, sister, watch TV then. Because I really do feel that it's her and that she is always with me and that's healing to me. And there was this one time when we were, we were growing up, she was putting on this pair of boots and I never laughed so hard in my life. She was like, there's something something in my shoe. I don't know. I can't put it on. And she pulled her shoe up to her face and looked at it. And one of those little wall frogs jumped out and landed on her face. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I see one of those little frogs, it, it reminds me of her. And so I have them out in the front of my house everywhere. It's weird. But yeah, I over the years, no, it doesn't get any easier but your community and your family help you get through those times and then there's other things that just arise that help you and so I, I really do believe that she follows me and that she's with me thank you thank you thank you both for sharing those things um and I and I'm I love that there is healing in this for you that's important um and and it for you, Marlene, to finish school in the face of a crisis like that, and we all know that university systems in and of themselves are difficult for Indigenous women, so thank you so much for even continuing that. It sets an example that so many of our, our young women need uh, to celebrate, so I, uh, I honor that for you, so thank you so much. Um, I'm always interested then, uh, this is going to go back to you, Tabitha and Jacqueline, about when what happens when they come home, right? What happens, what do they need when they come home? What services um, are provided? Does your organization do that? Or is that provided by somebody else in the community? So do you have any thoughts on what happens after they've come back? That's such a great question. So what we do, we actually do provide services here at our office as well. Um, our boss, Norm Weech, does have um, training in the trauma, trauma therapy. IFOT, yeah. Yes. And um, he, he does that practice here at the office, but um, most family members would rather take them home to their own community to do their healing. Mm -hmm. So we respect that for them as well. And we actually encourage them to go home and do the, the practices themselves in their own communities. But we also, um, to go back to one of your um, questions, we actually do train the police officers um, in residential school. We, we inform them. Um, and the trainees. So like this, there's like college here that for police officers that we go to. And then um, we do like, so that they're, I think, they're the newer police officers. The new recruits. They're the <laughs> new, new recruits. recruits, yeah. So we go there and we inform them with the residential school and why people don't trust them in the beginning and why Indigenous people are the way they are. And um, it's an eye-opener for them. They didn't realize how much trauma we carried and how much trauma our ancestors had and then passing it down to us. So. Um, we inform them and let them know what goes on in the residential school and we actually bring in some residential school survivors 
and tell their story. So it's a bit more catching hearing it from an actual survivor. And um, it gives them a different perspective. So they see it and they, when they search the streets now, they don't take it personal when an indigenous person comes at them angry or doesn't trust them in the beginning. And um, some people get it, some people don't. And it's, I don't know, I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> you could just sense it in the room. Like you can, you know, when we're going around with the smudge bowl, if there's no ones that are like, like, no, we can't, we can't do that. We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> there's just, you can, you can just sense in the room who's actually paying attention. And, and I guess the, the greatest outcome from that is that some people that are very standoffish in the beginning, um, you know, they're usually the person that ends up crying, you know, once the elders are telling their story, because it's very hard to ignore um, an elder when they're talking about their experience and they're saying that they're five years old and this and this happened to them, you know, it's a lot, a lot of them say that, you know, I learned about residential school from a textbook and the effects from what I heard from a textbook and what I heard from this elder, you know, not the same. is not the same. And the elder, you know, that's something, the elder story is something that they, they carry with them because mm -hmm. now, now they have that story and they have to acknowledge that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so Cinder, this, this, uh, I'm not going to make assumptions, but I hope that this question isn't intrusive for you, but what is, what does healing look and feel like? Is that even, uh, feasible for you during this time? What would you like us to know about what that's, what, what that's like for you? Well, it's still very emotional for me since it's, has, he's been gone for about a year, 18 months now. Um, it's very emotional for me, um, just because, you know, I, I'm still actively looking and, you know, we're trying to bring awareness, trying to get people to come forward, um, and they're, you know, and the rumors that are out there, so it's fresh in my mind, um, all the time. Um, I get questions from family and community members about, you know, what, what's going on with this case. So, you know, that brings the emotions back. Um, but I think right now my biggest support is my family and my community and the efforts that um, MMIP and Fort Hall has, you know, they've done for our family in, you know, trying to um, find Matt um, here. But that's, you know, it's just something that's always, you know, in my mind, but that's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, thank you. Mm, thank you. And Melina, I'll bring, bring it back to you regarding the healing piece. I think that you're in an interesting place, um, not only providing awareness around MMIW, but also um, recovery space. So what, do, what does that recovery space look like for folks? Does it work for both survivors and community members and for yourself? Like what does healing look like in that space for you all? Um, for us, it's um, acknowledging those traumas, the pain that goes with, you know, the alcohol and drug uh, struggle, the missing, um, and the boarding school traumas. Mm. Uh, for me, you know, um, it's it's something I'm doing because I've lost two sons, um, one to suicide and one in a car accident. And, you know, it's hard for me to watch mothers go through searching for their missing. Um, I do have a family member, my uncle, that is been missing for 34 years and then last year they declared him deceased and um, with no body you know and so 
it gets really emotionally tiring, but I use my, um, you know, some ceremonial ways and smudging and making sure I'm okay, self-care, um, so that I don't, you know, I get involved in Sometimes I carry it because I'm a caring person, so I will bring it home, and I just feel really sad sometimes, but I've got to learn to separate myself from it, and I'm learning that really good now, And um, but I really, you know, I have to be out there making awareness because we need to find these individuals, and um, sometimes our community don't really understand like the new missing murdered um, individual stuff. Um, but, you know, we just keep pushing and um, it does get hard. It does wear and tear, but, you know, I have to use my smudging and everything to keep myself going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I noticed Jacqueline started a smudge. I smudge while we sit here. I've been doing it all month long. <laughs> I. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our practice of smudging, there are some indigenous nations who use the smoke from cedar, tobacco, sweet grass, or sage um, as a medicine. It carries prayers, it cleanses the space. It's a grounding practice for us. Um, and, and it's old, it's a very old, old practice for a lot of us as well. And uh, in, my, in my community in particular, we believe that our some of our prayers, all of our prayers are carried through the smoke. Uh, which is why it's held sacred to us. Um, there was uh, part of my session um, around how best to serve domestic, uh, ser serve Native American communities or families impacted by domestic violence and making that space accessible and approachable for indigenous folks was to have smudge or some other medicine in the office or in the space or in the shelter. Um, and it just even it being there is a point of comfort. You don't necessarily know how to use it. I wouldn't, I'm not telling you to appropriate it or go buy it at Urban Outfitters. What I'm telling you is do your best to make that accessible for families impacted by violence. So if you are a non-native service provider, I'm happy to give you some guidance on that. Um, just so that uh, y your offices are, are um, your offices and your spaces are feel like home or feel familiar. Uh, there's also, um, there were a couple of things that y'all brought up. I don't wanna to dig too deep into some of these things, but thank you for sharing the, the healing um, portion of what this journey is like for you. Um, and I know that uh, the healing isn't a straight and narrow, it's not a linear path. Um, that's some of it, it's got highs and lows, peaks and valleys, and we really wanna recognize and honor that that's, a, that's also a struggle in addition to um, navigating the spaces to find our sisters, find our relatives. So know that my thoughts and my prayers are always going to be with you in this work. Um, there was a question that came through in the chat about um, classes or trainings that's available uh, to teach our youth about how to protect themselves from MMIP and MMIW. Um, if you, uh, Jacqueline and, and Tabitha, I'll, I'll swing back to you in just a moment, but I do want to contextualize that for those of you who ask questions of that nature. Um, our first principle is that um, we live in a society where the expectation or the, the onus of responsibility for protection is put on folks who could be impacted, folks who are most marginalized, folks who are um, the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable, when in fact we should be focusing our efforts on building a community that doesn't require us to even learn how to protect ourselves. Uh, all morning long, I've been helping some of my co conspirators, co-conspirators and colleagues in anti-racism work learn how to build themselves a safety plan. And they shared gratitude with me about the fact that I have a safety plan and that I was willing to share it. But I resent that we live in a society where I have to have a safety plan, where I have to teach young people who are 19 and 20 years old how to protect themselves, how to be safe, how to flee, um, how, you know, how to survive. And that is a really painful 
thing for me. It's jarring. It's uh, intergenerational trauma that we carry and that is triggered as part of having those conversations. In 2020, we should not have young people of color learning how to protect themselves from violence. We shouldn't be in a place where we have to create safety plans, but we are. So I want us to acknowledge that this is an issue or a symptom of a much bigger problem. And then the second piece to that, um, classes and trainings about, about this work and about MMIP and about residential schools is also very taxing, right? We have to not only carry our own healing and carry the um, navigating the trauma, but we're now also having to share this knowledge with folks who are generally non-Native, non-Indigenous um, on how to work with our communities. So that's a, that's a heavy ask. So, I mean, the short answer, I know in Idaho, we don't have classes or trainings available for young people. Um, um, these conversations do take place in community spaces. In my tribe specifically, I know that they take place in um, in community spaces, which is good. I talk to my nieces about it as in the most approachable way that I can. Um, I don't travel alone much anymore in the way that I used to. So it's kind of like it. It's a, it has an adverse effect on the way that we live our lives. We are not living in a liberated space if I don't. I take a lot of joy in traveling and now I don't. Um, I don't travel because <laughs> it's just not the safest thing. I mean, one in the face of a pandemic, but two, just the risk is so high. Um, so I'm gonna pivot that question back to Tabitha and Jacqueline. What does that look like for training um, law enforcement? Do schools get training? Like what, uh, how, how can that be implemented? How is that built? Who facilitates it? That kind of thing. Okay, so I, I host a women's uh, group with uh, some of the most vulnerable women um, here in the city. And um, we talk about safety tips all the time. You know, don't walk alone, don't walk with your headphones in, um, you know, how to minimize yourself as a target, what to do if you find yourself as a target. Um, and I just recently finished a self-defense course um, just the other week and I talked to my boss and I told him that that was something that I wanted to do um, with our women so it's in the works for us like myself and top of that to be trained so that we can go out in our community um, you know teach our young our young youth how to defend themselves in the event that they that they are a target and they are being attacked um, so we're pretty excited about it. Uh, we're hoping that we can get that done uh, sooner rather than later and that we can be in the schools and you know, uh, working uh, on the downtown east side with where some of our most vulnerable women are and they definitely need the training there because that's usually the targeted area um, for where women go missing. It's also, the most common area for us to locate and find our women is on the downtown east side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I know that you mentioned Jerry Moma earlier. I um, was connected with her through Brody Sanchez. So I know that she does some human trafficking training. I'm just not quite sure on all the details. So I think maybe you, Ty, could probably maybe you have more information with um, what she does and what kind of classes she has. But I would definitely recommend Jerry. She's such a good person. and She's been doing this work for so many years. But yeah. That's great. That's good to know. And you know, it's, here's the thing that's most poignant about what y'all are doing is that it's in, it's indigenous led, <laughs> absolutely. All, any prevention and response or collaboration around MMIP in any capacity absolutely needs to be indigenous led. So I wanna underscore that as loud as I possibly can for those of you who are non-native with us. Your intentions, while good, still need to take a backseat to the fact that all of this work and community needs to be led by Indigenous people. Um, so that's that's really poignant. And a part a part of that too is that it's more much much more approachable when we see our own faces represented in facilitation in leadership. Um, 
in these collaborative spaces. So uh, that's why it's really important um, to keep in mind that we need to be at the forefront of these conversations. Excuse me, my earrings trying to run away from me. My end in bling. <laughs> Um, all right. And thank you, Bernie, for mentioning that Coeur d'Alene um, will be hosting Jerry's training in May of 2021. Yes, Jerry is a survivor of trafficking, um, amongst other things, prostitution, substance abuse. Her story is incredibly powerful, very moving, and she connects with so many folks when she does come to a space to present. Um, so I encourage you to keep an eye out for any any work that Jerry does. Um, she was supposed to have a uh, MMIW conference in May. Of course, that was set aside for in the face of COVID. But she's based out of uh, Puyallup, if I'm not mistaken. So that's where she's at in the Seattle Tacoma area. Uh, but yes, she's so those trainings uh, from from Jerry are focused on. Um, what to look for um, as far as high risk, and then removing the stigma from things like sex, uh, sex work, from substance abuse, from chronic runaway, uh, from abuse, uh, emotional abuse, uh, combative young people, like all of these things that we've put a stigma on, um, those are also things that make folks at high risk for being missing or murdered. Um, I also wanna call in the fact that our two-spirit relatives are the most marginalized of the marginalized in this. So um, the, um, some of the data has illustrated that um, two-spirit folks, when they come out to their families, then become home and food insecure, which makes them susceptible to trafficking, and then become um, a two-spirit missing or murdered. So that's something that we should absolutely name, having conversations about the intersection of uh, our LGBTQ and two-spirit relatives is important in this work. So I want to name that. Um, if you want more information about that, Lenny Hayes is the person to talk to, and then there are a handful of other two two-spirit uh, advocates who are doing this work specifically around two-spirit missing and murdered. So um, so we, I just want to bring that into the space. Um, I, if those were, the, that's the end of my questions and we're actually doing very well for time, but I want to invite um, the, the audience that's with us. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or put them in the q and I will, however, allow my panelists to either opt in or opt out of these questions um, at your discretion. So please don't feel any pressure to answer questions if they feel too intrusive, because I know that this is um, sensitive and deeply emotional. Uh, so please know that I honor and respect your privacy and your um, and your willingness or not to answer these questions. So does anybody in our audience today have any questions for our panelists? I'll give them a minute. Do our panelists have any other remarks you'd like to share? Things that you would like our audience to take away from their time with us today? Well, I just wanna share that um, in part of, I guess you could say the healing process is that um, many times uh, people know or suspect or think that they know who who murdered or who um, did their family member in and the fact that um, they don't they don't end up going to jail and a lot they don't get prosecuted for it and you don't get a body back and I mean there's just so many things that um, go on top of that, um, that there can be a hatred, resentment, um, a lot of feelings and stuff that you might have towards um, people that you believe that have done this to your loved one. And it takes a long time, or maybe it doesn't for some people, but it took me probably about seven years to heal from that and to realize that I didn't have to have hatred or animosity or anything else towards anybody that I thought that may have committed 
this crime against my sister. And it is a healing process that when you get to that point, um, it's you let that go. You let that go and you realize that you can have you can still have relations with people, you can forgive people. And for me, it was um, sitting in church Easter Sunday and realizing that our creator had um, forgiven a murderer. And I realized that I was not anybody but a woman. And then I had no power to say that a person goes to hell or a person goes to heaven. And that if our creator wanted to forgive somebody that he wanted to have um, a different type of people, a, a people where he hung on the cross for, a people where there was forgiveness and love, a people where when we as Indian people have been hurt and traumatized, do we continue to hurt and traumatize or do we forgive and, and learn to love and try to help other people and give them that hand up? And so healing comes, from, is, comes deep and it comes from learning that maybe that murderer, maybe that something happened to them. Maybe if they changed and stuff, our world wouldn't be like this and maybe that's what we're working for and so healing become it comes full circle and that's what i pray for i pray for healing for all of our people for our people that have been traumatized deeply traumatized and that we have to work together and then if we if we hold that hatred and animosity in our heart then we can't go further. We can't, we can't go, we can't do anything. And so it is a process of the, that we can heal together and we can be there for one another. Thank you so much for sharing that, Marlene. Um, you have just demonstrated something that I champion everywhere in community that indigenous people always seem to have a level of compassion and grace and forgiveness that's unmatched because um, we heal in community and it makes us very strong. So uh, that that actually really tugs on all of my heartstrings. So thank you so much for sharing, sharing that wisdom and having that kind of love and compassion uh, for yourself and for the community and for for our entire uh, indigenous nations that carry trauma. Trauma begets trauma, trauma begets violence. And so for you to say that interrupts, interrupts that pattern, interrupts that cycle. So I have a lot of gratitude for that. Thank you. Uh, did, any, uh, did anybody else have any closing remarks you wanted to share? I just wanted to say thank you, Ty, for allowing me to come on here and express what I do and um, how I put in so much work into the MMIP. Um, and it actually brought me closer to my partner, Brody Sanchez. That's actually how we met. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank everyone for allowing me to speak my truth and um, allowing us to express how we work here in uh, Vancouver, Vancouver, Canada. So thank you, Ty, for having us. Of course, thank you for being here. Okay, um, I want to uh, um, bring us to a close on the panelist section um, and express Kamakas uh, a deep thank you for being here. Um, talks he was taught today is a good day. It's a principle that I've learned amongst my people that it's even through the hardship, we find moments of joy and we find moments of laughter and it um, warms my heart that we are all here in community together today. Uh, I, um, 
The way that I built this conference is a little out of the ordinary from a cultural standpoint. It was very difficult to hold on to the cultural pieces that matter to us. Um, we should always be starting and ending with an elder, but I didn't do that for every single session. We should always start and end with prayers or um, spiritual remarks of some sort, but we didn't do that either. Uh, however, I will um, change that up for today. But before I do that, I invited um, somebody that I met on the powwow trail. Sunny, are you with us? I just need to make sure that you're here. There you are. Hey. All right. So I met back when I powwowed. <laughs> I, uh, I met Sunny on the powwow trail. He's um, from the Klamath Modoc nations and I um, love uh, his drum. His drum group is called Silent Hill. And uh, so in a cultural space at a, or any time that we gather, it is important to honor uh, those who are missing, those who are lost to us, um, to honor ourselves and our own healing, to honor the strength and resilience of our indigenous communities, to honor the uh, presence of our non-native neighbors who are joining us, um, and so that's why I've asked Sunny to sing the song that will um, bring our session somewhat to a close. And then our final and closing remarks for this conference will be from Bernie Lassart, who is uh, somebody that I very much love and honor. And uh, by proxy, she's friends with my favorite auntie. So now Bernie is also my favorite auntie. And then, um, and then we will bring our conference to a close. This was the first ever 2020 uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Conference hosted by the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. So I'm very thankful that you all joined us. Um, Sunny, please feel free to take it away. Hi, thank you very much. Um, for the opportunity. Um, I've, uh, I like to apologize for being a little late to the party, but you know, I was, um, I was busy with health issues. And right now, um, I'd like to say everything that I've listened to this morning is uh, quite a learning experience. Uh, for me, I'm a probation officer in training. So learning, uh, like, you know, just listening is learning and, and um, I'm just honored to be able to share a song. Um, before I begin, I just like to say um, that uh, this song I'm going to sing, I made back in June 2020. I made it for my brother-in-law's high school graduation. And these type of honor songs are meant for occasions like this. So with having said that, I'd like to reshare the song that I made for my brother-in-law's graduation. And, and also like, you know, when I sing this song, I'd just like for everyone to think about, like, you know, I guess like pray, uh, uh, hear, keep positive thoughts. And, and um, these songs are healing and, and I'm honored to share that with you all today. So here we go. <clears throat> Hey, I, 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 hey, I
Thank you, Sunny. A lot of gratitude there. All right, Auntie Bernie, take it away. Finish us off. Thank you, Hi. This was an excellent conference, lots of um, excellent speakers, topics. Um, what, would, what we do with it next, um, is so important. in bringing our people back home. I think one of the, um, one of the things that is most important in doing that, and all of us here has that opportunity to really make a difference in this, indigenous crises and what we can do is and I I hate to say this because one of the stereotypes of women of course is uh, nagging but I think that's what we need to continue to do and we need to take what we've learned and take it to our tribal leaders, to our communities. Um, we need to, to work with our, our task force that are being formed to deal with this matter, um, to promote collaboration with other tribes, with counties, with states, and with the federal government. We need to promote this collaboration to no end, because that is the only way that we are going to, to make major changes on the way that um, Native people are treated. And I've listened to some of you talk about the jurisdictional issues, uh, sovereignty and, and the lack of communication amongst tribes. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we have to risk losing our sovereignty but enhancing it by this much needed collaboration across the board. We need to promote with our um, task force to, to get legislation done that requires our state, our counties and cities to collaborate with tribes and for tribes to collaborate with these um, other organizations. This is a matter that is beyond our reservations and beyond our own tribal councils and our tribes. It's much greater than that. Um, we need to continue to be out there and to um, continue this awareness. We can't let it stop. We need to keep this going. We need to talk to our children. We need to get into the schools. Uh, we do need to, to be proactive in that regard. I totally agree. And we all, everybody in this conference 
has the power to do that. Don't become a silo. Put everything that you learned to good use, not just in finding our families who are missing and have been murdered, but for those also that have not occurred yet, because it's going to continue as long as we, as long as we let it. We are women and we are men and we have a lot of power here. We can talk to our, our, our own tribes and our tribal leaders. We can't ignore this any longer. We all have a part in this. I wanna thank Ty and the Idaho Coalition for putting this conference on. It was remarkable and I'm sorry I didn't get to tune in every single day, but I've been working on this matter here in Idaho as Ty has and the coalition to make some changes to, to hopefully get some legislation done in Washington, DC to get a communication system going uh, where we can enter all of our data so we know where we're at. We have numbers, we know we, know we have a lot of people missing, not just native women, but a lot of men. We know it's a lot, we just don't know how many. We need to, we owe it to them to come to grips with this. Thank you. Lim Lynch. Marcus Katsiayo, Bernie, thank you for that, for your support, Katsiayo. for all that you do for us and for me. Um, I, I take all of my cues from you. To all of you that have attended in October, um, we have a lot of deep gratitude for you from the Idaho Coalition. Um, we'll keep sending you a couple of emails with follow-ups, evaluations, um, your professional credit availability at Boise State University, as well as links to videos once those are ready for you. Um, but that brings our um, conference, Honoring Missing and Murdered Indigenous People to a close. Uh, for 2020. Thanks again so much for joining us and we will see you in the revolution y'all. Take care. Mm -hmm.